Hi everyone, I'm Sloan from SloanBella.com and I'm back with another Channeled Celebrity Energy video. I was a little bit hesitant to do this video because of the proximity between when this person passed away and it's only been a few weeks, less than a month, maybe a month, something like this, probably a month. And I'm talking about Colby Bryant. I'm talking about January 26, 2020, approximately 10 a.m. in the morning when we heard the news, the radio, got the texts, whatever it was, that Colby, his daughter, and the seven other people on the plane had passed away in a helicopter accident, not plane, helicopter accident. So I wanted to start off with the energy around that. And I realized I'm probably going to be fodder for the haters online because I'm speaking a little bit sideways and around the issue. And probably people don't want me to say that about their idol because remember, we have idol worship in America when it comes to sports. It's big business and big money. And therefore, there's huge fanfare when somebody passes away in any form of entertainment to which I consider sports to be entertainment with agility. So these people are harnessed and their energy is used and their power in their sport is used in order to attract all kinds of things into the circle that they belong. Having said that, I'm going to go back to the morning that Colby died. And I want to start off first. Oh my God. I want to start off first by saying he's a Virgo. Okay, so we know this. It is August 23rd, 1978. So he's a very young man. So he's a Virgo sun. Now, Virgo sun, they are mutable earth, okay? So earth is really diligent, perfectionistic, and will focus on things till the end of time. Like you cannot break a Virgo's concentration. And they basically have this like a little weird dry sense of humor because they think they're the best at whatever they do. Now in Kobe's case, this was probably applicable for a lot of his professional life and maybe his home life too. I'm not sure. However, the Virgo sun was and is in alignment with that kind of perfectionistic standard that he held from for himself. So he's not one of those athletes that is going off on a drunk bender for six months and then breaks his ankle and then we don't hear from him, although he did end his career with in injuries, which I would expect after so many years playing, but he wasn't like an emotional mess. Virgos usually don't do that. If they do it, they do it very privately and they do it in the context of their thinking. So they will, they will ruminate in their thinking. Now, he had a Taurus moon. Okay, so Taurus moon, okay, Taurus rules Venus, or Venus is ruled by Taurus, but Taurus moon is interesting. It's very traditional emotionally, and by traditional, I mean it really harnesses the Earth's energy. So the things that we consider valuable on the Earth in the mundane world, meaning the non-spiritual world, things like money and food, prestige, fame, cars, girls, kids, houses, horses, whatever. Whatever it is people can buy with money, that is like a Taurus moon thing. They need stability and they need consistency within the context of their Taurus moon. That's the second earth sign. The third thing that threw it right over the edge and was activated by the eclipses on the nodes, the eclipse point of the nodal axis recently, was his Capricorn rising. He had that Capricorn rising. So Capricorn rising is the biggest pain in the butt because they will work and work and work and work and work and work. So you can never really find them having fun because the context of his kind of energy, triple earth sign, would be to work to have fun, to gather more material goods so that he could manifest within that context. So he was extremely good at that. He would have been, regardless of where he was born, who he was born to, and all of those things. Now, what I liked about his chart, which I found fascinating because we went into a Mercury retrograde, okay? And I'm not sure if the crash was in the shadow period or not. I have to think about that. I have to go back and look it up. I didn't look that up prior to doing the video. But he was born with a Mercury retrograde in Leo. I found this fascinating because he specifically came back in this lifetime to complete a path which was not done in the most recent past life. So his contract was basically set up. I really got the impression from looking at Colby's chart, and I looked at it really briefly, okay? So 
This is not a huge astrological thing. Sometimes I get the hater emails and they're like, oh, well, the astrology chart. I'm like, shut up. I'm not even looking at it, okay? But I am looking at it briefly. I'm not like doing a reading on the chart, but I just go with what catches me. What I noticed with his, okay, so he's got Neptune coming close to the 12th house cusp, okay? And he's got Mercury retrograde in his natal chart. We are in a Mercury retrograde right now, which means all the little babies being born on the earth right now will have Mercury retrograde in their natal chart. They will be born with it. So they will be the people that grow up and think in a spiritual sense. So it is a formulation in a spiritual sense. Mercury retrograde comes back in a lifetime to focus away from the mundane materialism. And by mundane, I mean earthbound concept, okay? Not spiritual. But Mercury retrograde is spiritual. That's why it's retrograde. That's why you're to focus away from material. So this would have been a conflict with how he thought. And it would have also primed his ego to, because it was in Leo, it would have primed his ego to be seen in a certain way, in a certain context within his own spiritual nature. So if he was able to elevate himself spiritually, this would be something he would want to do, okay? Just coming in with that Mercury in retrograde. Now, what the, the thing that was pivotal and key in his chart was Saturn in the eighth house. Oh my God. Okay, Saturn in the eighth house is usually, from my experience as an astrologer for over 30 years, very, very, very indicative of the plight of the abused child. I will not say he was an abused child. That is not what I'm saying. But they are well aware of the abuse of children and what it does. And I'm talking the sexual nature and the karmic repercussions of that. So when somebody has an 8th house Saturn, they are born into circumstances where that is screamingly obvious and they will deal with it on some level, whether it be them or the parents that raised them came from that or that happens to their children, but they will deal with it, okay? So they will deal with those karmic repercussions of the abuse of children. That's very briefly, but that is a standard MO for Saturn in the eighth house. Okay, now let's look at it also in the context of Saturn in the eighth house and how that might affect a person born with it in, in perspective to their religious belief systems. Because if you're looking at Mercury in the seventh retrograde, you're looking at a group construct when it comes to thinking in a spiritual way. So he would have aligned himself in a spiritual sense with a group of people of like-minded belief systems. But where did these belief systems come from? They came from the eighth house because the Saturn is there. So these are the elders in the family or the patriarchal energy around the family lives in the eighth house. Okay, now throw that out of your head for a second and let's go to what happened the morning that Kobe was in the helicopter accident or crash or circumstance. I'm going to call it a helicopter circumstance. I'm going to say to you that that morning, now I'm on the other side of the valley, so I'm on the other side of the tracks on the valley. He was in the Calabasas side. I'm in the ghetto side, okay? So I'm deep, deep, deep on the other side, <laughs> diametrically down the freeway the opposite way, okay? So I'm on the eastbound side, not the westbound side. However, I like my side, okay? So anyway, that morning, of course, I got up to go running. When I opened the front door, it was incredibly foggy. That is actually factual. Like, it was super, super foggy. So we got in my car, and I drove to the mountain, probably, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes away. And I started to climb up my mountain, okay? So I climbed above the clouds, which I would say were at about 2,500 feet, and then you could see all across the valley. You could see over to Calabasas and beyond and everywhere else. Sometimes you can see all the way out, like out to the ocean, like on a free day, or if it's a cloudy day, you can see all the way out. But there was like a layer of clouds, and it did look like it was incredibly um, fogged in or cloudy, 
misty. The weather was weird. I did notice that morning there was a dead silence. And it was the morning of the eve of the Grammys. Okay, that no, that night would have been the Grammys. So it was that morning. And I remember when I got back in the car from running is when we heard that Kobe had had the helicopter, died in the helicopter accident, the nine people that passed. It didn't sit right with me from the beginning. It just didn't sit right with me. All right, so let me just move it a little bit differently. Now let's go back and let's think about how you were raised. I'm talking about you guys watching the video, all of us. Do we remember when we were young, maybe age five to 10, how we were raised? What was our family theological structure? What religion were we raised in? Were we Catholic? Were we Jewish? Were we Buddhist? Were we Scientologists? Were our parents Wiccans? Were they spiritualists? Were they Islamic? How were we raised? Was it traditional upbringing or was it really, really orthodox, specific and precise? And if you deviated in one moment from it, there was huge repercussions. So you were frightened to step outside of your family's box as far as religion. How were you really, how were you raised? Do you remember? Do you remember the first time that you consciously understood what God you were praying to? Did you go to Sunday school? Or in the case of the way I was raised, it was an agnostic house. There was no religion in the house. So there was no Sunday school unless I was staying over at a friend's house and it was expected through that friend's family, then I would follow them to Sunday school. That's about the only time I went to Sunday school actually was through my neighbor that I used to stay at her house and her parents insisted she had to go every week. So I would just go with her. No skin off my back. It was whatever it was, a different experience. But do you remember the first time that you understood the context of your family's religion? Now let's say, go back 30 years. Let's say you're in a religion like Scientology. It's not accepted mainstream. It seems weird to most people. It's not even in the context of a God, the way that people traditionally perceive it, okay? So let's say you're a Scientologist. Let's say you practice voodoo as your religion. Let's say you are a witch doctor. Let's say you're a spiritualist and you talk to the dead and speak in tongues. These things are not considered, quote, Normal. I'm by normal I mean acceptable by 90% of the population that goes, oh, I've heard of that, I understand it. So let's say you come from a family, and it's a family like your family and like my family, but this family practices a religion where they pray to a god that they believe is the great liberator, so a Luciferian god. And let's say this god that they pray to has certain rituals that are to be followed at certain times of the year, much like we have, you know, in, in, the, in the Christian religion, we have Easter, we have Christmas, we have all of these dates where we practice and we're, well, we're basically forced by society because they shut everything down for these holidays. Do any of us really give it a second thought? Do we, do, do we actually sit and go like, why do I have to partake in this? Or do I even want to partake in it? Do we do our own thing? Do we celebrate even though we don't agree? What is it we do? But let's say your family comes from one of these abstract, I'll call it an abstract religion, okay? Not one that most of us would follow or understand. But let's say it's Luciferianism and it's steeped with a cult ritual. Now, what is a ritual? Well, let's look at Orthodox Judaism when they can't use the electricity and they wear the wigs and you know, they do certain things. I'm not so familiar with every aspect of the ritual, but there are rituals that they have. Like the Orthodox Jewish people will actually shave their heads and wear wigs. That's part of the context of the religion they practice. Let's look at Catholics. Let's look at midnight masses. Let's look at when they received the blood and the body of Christ. Let's look at all of that. Let's take these little elements that are rituals. They wear robes. Um, the Vatican does certain things at certain times of the year. All of these things are religious ritual. A lot of them are practiced by the calendar, the lunar calendar, the moon calendar, um, which is the lunar calendar, the Western calendar, all kinds of different calendars, the sun calendar. There's many different dates throughout the year that these religious rituals are practiced on all throughout the year, all different religions stacked on top of each other, okay? So everybody has their right to religious freedom or so it is said. 
But what if it isn't? What if your religion, Luciferianism, was entirely different? And there were certain things that were practiced within the context of your religion that most people wouldn't understand. So you just don't talk about it with the exception of the people that practice the same religion as you. And let's say before you're born, because I really believe that this has a point in the soul's origin on the other side. And I'm going to say something a bit strange here in reference to Kobe Bryant. The family he was born into and the acceptance of the experiences I feel he was born into this family, but I also feel that he was, I'll use the word marked before he came in, okay? Meaning he came in as a little kid and no little kid really knows what they're up for when they're two, three, four, whatever. And I feel like maybe even in a way of kind of spiritual and, okay, uh, disassociation. We can call it spiritual disassociation. The child had the skill and the body and chose to incarnate in into this family that had access to the MBA and the sports and the people and the, the correct elements. But let's say this kid was born into a family where they practiced an abstract religion and as the kid got really good, really good at his skill, okay, as Colby was, really agile, really athletic, really practiced, really skilled as any Virgo would be. A Virgo will shoot a ball into a hoop ad nauseum. I mean, they just won't stop. They will do whatever it is they are doing until they are perfect at it. Even though there's no such thing, they will come as close to it as a person can come to being perfect. But let's say maybe age 17, because that's the age I'm marking with him. Let's say at age 17, he's approached by religious elders and the family and everybody feels like it's a good idea to initiate him into the club so that he can really be a leader in the church. Much like in Buddhism, when they see a child, they search all over for the reincarnation of Buddha and then they elevate that child who's two and three, you've seen the pictures, but I mean like a little kid, right? And they find the soul, this is what they say they're doing, they find the soul and suddenly the soul is marked in Buddhism for greatness within the context of their spiritual family and belief system. This is what I feel Colby was picked for. I feel like they use sports because sports is huge money, huge business, big business, and he could... I'm going to use the word manipulate, but he could indoctrinate, socially engineer, and placate the masses with his brilliant skill. So he was a good target. So they picked this child and he believed what was being presented and followed through in the religious teachings. Okay, so let's say he's 17, 18, 25 and he's got girls and money and he's got people cheering for him and clapping. Keep in mind, when you have that level of fame, all of the fans focused on you energetically, you are taking from them. There's a form of, I'll use the word vampirism, so to speak, but there's a form of energy exchange that comes from the audience sending their energy to the person that they idolize and that person opening up their energy field to grow and expand. I'm talking behind the scenes of the physical body and gain power. So basically storing energy for fuel to become stronger and stronger. That's kind of how it works energetically. Look at a charismatic preacher that goes out there and has a congregation like somebody on the 700 club, Pat Robertson, I don't know, whoever, any of these people. Um, I don't even know. Oh, the smiley guy, uh, Joel Olstein, <laughs> the smiley guy. You know, I mean, the smiley guy, um, him, the, you know, they're gathering power from their congregation. This is part of the reason they do it. So Colby is set up in a position in society so that we all listen to him. They charge so much money for those games. People pay it because their kids cry and they want to go see this Colby and wear his jersey. I know my kids did. My Keithy did when he played basketball. I know this. They want it. They want to be like that. They want to emulate it. It's idol worship. Um, and then I'll ask you to think in the context of his death, which I was really shocked and it took me a while not to speak about it and actually got into an argument with somebody <laughs> about it. But 
Like, why are you charging tickets to a funeral? I know it's supposed to go to charity. This is what this person said. I'm like, who the hell owns the charity? We never check on this shit. Who charges for a funeral? Besides the funeral home, it's their business. But why am I, am I like, if I die, I'm going to charge my family tickets to come to the funeral. And because he's Kobe, we should do this. I disagree immensely with this, but it doesn't matter because I'm not in charge of anything. But just look at how it's set up. Now, what if, in your climb for spiritual greatness, much like the little Buddhist baby that's found and is going to be the new spiritual leader when he reaches of age, what if your religion said to you, we want you to put in 20, 30 years of great service, okay? And we're going to illuminate you and you're going to vibrate on a certain level. Keep in mind, this religion I'm talking about believes in other dimensions, astral levels, and crossing in and out of the physical or earthbound experience. Let's say your religion says to you, once you've lived this extraordinary life, it's presented that you could actually jump out of your physical body and cross dimensions and really move on into the next life. Let's go into the Egyptian religions and let's look at how they buried them with all of their gold and their trinkets and their pets, their cats, I think, were the guardians taking them into the next life. Well, it doesn't really happen like that in a physical sense. Obviously, the soul goes on if you believe it, but if you're atheist, you don't. I had a conversation this week about that too. Um, it's not scientific, therefore it doesn't exist. <laughs> Whatever. Um, okay, so let's say you agree to this and let's say you pick your exit date because your religion much like, uh, let's look at the doomsday cult. Well, they were a cult, but they believed they were a religion and they believed they were going to catch the energy at the end of a comet. I believe it was a comet that was coming. I don't remember which comet. And they were the ones, there was like 40 of them, maybe more, I don't know. And they all took some kind of pill to kill themselves on cyanide, whatever. And they're the ones that when they photograph the dead bodies in the bunk beds, they all had on like Nike shoes, which I find fascinating because we go to 2011 and we go to that Kobe commercial where there's a huge fire explosion and a helicopter at the end of it, the one with Bruce Willis and Kanye West, where Kanye West is the evil and Kobe defeats him and he's wearing the Nikes or it's about Nikes. I don't really know, but Nikes in there somehow. And then there's a huge helicopter crash. Okay, that is interesting. That could just be creative license. But then let's go to 2012, a year later, where we have Dot Noso's Twitter account, where we have the conclusion that's in writing that resurfaced after Kobe's death, that Kobe would indeed die in a helicopter crash. I got into this argument too with somebody because they said, well, obviously Kobe travels all the time by helicopter, which is true. Athletes, singers, musicians, they obviously, they're on planes, trains, automobiles, and helicopters so much more. They have more of a chance to die like that. Having said that, Kobe had more money than God and therefore had probably the best equipment and private everything. So it's probably safer that he fly than we fly because we're just going, you know, we're just the cattle that they're hauling around. They don't really care about us. So having said that, we have no control. I just get on an American Airlines plane and I've got to assume that they're keeping it where they're supposed to be keeping it or keeping it up to standards. So there was that 2012 Twitter account by Dot No So. Then in 2016, Legends of Chamberlain on, I think it was Cartoon Network, showed that cartoon that you've all seen going around the internet where Kobe dies in a helicopter crash. Okay, so that was the year that he ended his career, I believe. I wasn't ever, I didn't ever watch, really. Really, I didn't, but... Um, I think that's the year that he ended his career. So they were already implanting socially engineering, subconsciously getting us used to the idea that Kobe would die in a helicopter crash. This is called sigil magic. They always say art imitates life. That's a bunch of bullshit. They are putting the information out publicly and calling it art 
media manipulation is how I'd like to say it, and they're calling it art, and then they're telling us what's going to happen. They put it on magazine covers. They do it with virus outbreaks. Oh my God, everybody has to wear a mask. We're all going to die. I mean, they hype everything up, and it's just in order to corral us from thinking critically on our own and logically. Having said that, they did all of this with Kobe. He also passed away on the night of the Grammys. He passed away in the satanic calendar on the night of the great climax, which is five weeks and one day after the winter solar solstice. Um, so these things raise red flags for me. I'm like, I don't really understand what's going on, but I know that it's not the way it's presented. And if it's not the way it's presented, then it means there is an alternative to what is being presented to us and they have an agenda. Now the agenda, the way that Colby died, the fire, the plane crash, and the level of fame that the man had is very much along the lines of idol worship. So everybody, I mean, people were crying on the streets. I'm just going to ask y'all, I know I'm going to sound like a bitch, please don't say it this way. I know everybody loved his ability and I'm not questioning anything about him as a person or the ability. I'm saying he was born into a family where these behaviors were practiced much like you could be born into your religious family and whatever rituals and religion and traditions are practiced or practiced. It does not make you a bad person. It makes you believing that what you're doing is a certain way and we all come from different contexts. What if the soul is tricked into this? What if the soul is tricked by its need to be famous and successful and have something? What if it could get there anyway if everybody stopped playing these games energetically? But let's look at it a little bit differently. Let's look at how it happened. I actually feel that the level of sadness that people felt and the level of um, reverence for this person that a lot of them didn't know and bought tickets to his funeral. I'm sorry. That's a bit strange. That is a bit strange. That is like a mass hysteria. Um, I wanted to ask if you guys had family members that you paid that much attention to. I found it really odd. It's not something that made sense to me on any level. It makes no sense. Now, um, I, I get missing the person and he was a great sports athlete. I understand that. But if you don't know him personally, I don't understand what you're doing because you don't know him personally. So how do you really know? How do you really know? Um, you don't. You don't know. Uh, okay. So having said that, when I felt the energy, now this is, I'm going to go around to feeling the energy around it. When I felt the energy, I got the distinct impression. It felt like an energy vacuum to me that morning. It felt just like everything melded down and was pulled down. So I can see, and I'm going to say this, the way that I feel the helicopter crashed, I understand there was fog. I'm not stupid. I'm not just blonde and I'm not really blonde. So there, um, I do get that it was very foggy. I also love the way that the media kept saying he crashed in the Calabasas Hills. These are hills, okay? And the fog layer was pretty low laying, like 2,500 feet. I'd actually have to look that up with the weather people. But I was climbing on top of a mountain and you could see the sun above it. You could climb above it. I'm assuming this helicopter had radar. I'm assuming the pilot was aware of fog. And I'm assuming that everything had instruments to fly. I found it very, very, very strange that the helicopter had no black box. That would be the only vehicle in the world that didn't have a black box on it. Or we just don't want to acknowledge it had one and we're going to say it didn't. And then we're just going to rip it out and keep it to ourselves. Um, I also feel when I felt it, okay, so when I looked at the energy of the helicopter, forget everything else I said, when I looked at the energy of the helicopter, I felt the energy, okay, he, uh, a pyramid, upside down pyramid, triangle, upside down triangle, or yeah, upside down triangle, like the wide part here, and down, it was the latitude and longitude of where the plane went down, was part of the ritual, it was pulled magnetically down. I don't know what that means. I have no idea what that means. I don't feel it was an engine miscalculation, instrumental miscalculation, engine failure, none of that. I feel it was magnetically pulled down like this. That's what I get with it. It was a magnetic pull, okay? 
I also get that when Kobe and his daughter passed out of this life into the next, and I'm not picking up on their energy. I'm not doing that right now. I'm not doing it at all. I'm picking up on the energy around the circumstances. I can see that it was Kobe's belief that he would take his daughter into the next life with him and they would start a colony. This is kind of what I'm getting. Almost sounds like lost in space, doesn't it? It really reminded me of that. This is what I'm getting. I have no idea if that was the belief system, the reality. I don't know if it's a multi-dimensional thing. And, but what, what came to me is, um, okay, you know when people say they see Tupac? I just got an email, somebody saw him in New Mexico. So they said on the email, uh, you know when people say that or so-and-so's not dead or they don't feel dead or I feel them around, I actually think they're crossing into kind of parallel dimensions and I think that that's where Colby and his daughter went. And I think that that's why there's always speculation that the person isn't dead because you can feel the energy. It's like they opened a door sideways through a wall and they went that way, but we can't see the door or we're not equipped. Some of us can, others can't, some get glimpses of it, but this is what I feel like happened. I feel like the helicopter was literally purposely taken down by a magnetic force field in a particular location, particular on purpose. Colby was a big catch. If you can offer up this big catch to your God, look, look what we brought you. Let's go back to medieval times. Let's go back to monarchs, kings and queens. And let's go back to a person who's a lowly fisherman, say. And this person goes into the royal palace and brings the biggest fish in the whole sea. They are given special privileges. This is what I think happened. I think it happened. I think this is a ritualistic based on timing, latitude and longitude, the triangle upside down, pointing down, I'm seeing it, magnetic force field took the helicopter out of the air. That's what I see. That's what I got in this very long-winded round the circle video so that I can avoid as much hate mail as I can at this point. Um, I think if I were to say anything, I feel like souls get tricked on the earth into buying into the materialistic things and the money, the fame, the power that we see transiently running around this planet and the rest of us are made to feel like crap because we don't have it. There's starving people and there's this and there's that. I want you to pay attention to it because if you could have that kind of money, you would want it. What is your skill and is your skill for sale? That's how I want to say it. That is how I feel about it. I don't know if he was aware of this on this day. I do know that he took that daughter. I do know that he prayed. That was in the media. And I do know that he thought he and his daughter would step and colonize the next space. I do know that. I don't know why the other people, I will tell you something too, the pilot that flew the plane, I know everybody's gonna blame the pilot because he doesn't count on the planet because only Kobe counts. That's what they say it. Kobe and his daughter. What about the other people on this helicopter? I keep calling it a plane. The pilot, the pilot seems to have been confused with his movements at the time. So he was flying the helicopter and it was being pulled downwards. That's like a magnetic force field. So that's some kind of a magnetic reaction is what I'm getting. That's what I'm getting. All right, you guys, once again, my name is Sloan from SloanBella.com.